At first sight, the odds seem hopeless, flesh and bone against the fury of a Kuwait oil fire. It is the ultimate up close and personal. Firefighters creep within 15 feet of flames burning at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They are one small step away from being torched. A sudden windshield, a broken water pump, exploding coke, all could kill them. Their protection seems flimsy and their tools look primitive compared to the power of the flames. Metal sheets act as heat sheets. They wear simple cotton clothes and underwear and heat reflecting suits. But mainly they survive by wit and cunning. So one can't help but be amazed that in this epic struggle, flesh and bone is winning. The beast is being slain. This is the Kuwait National Firefighting Team. It represents a new spirit in Kuwait. It includes the only woman firefighter in the field, Sarah Ackerman, a petroleum engineer and a war hero who helped change computer files to keep Iraqis from destroying key pipelines. On this day, late in September, the Kuwait team is fighting its seventh well fire in 10 days. The other six well fires have been snuffed and capped. This well in the Minigis field is a deep, high-pressure well and nearly all natural gas. Since there is little crude oil, combustion is almost 100%, and it is one of the hottest fires in the oil fields. Before they can kill the flames burning at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, crew members must creep to within four or five meters of the dragon's roaring mouth. I can describe this actually in two words. It's hot and dangerous. Firefighters are also protected by a water curtain sprayed from slits in corrugated metal shacks. The water is actually between us and the well, so it's, uh, it's extinguishing the fire. In addition to that, it's uh, cooling uh, uh, whoever behind it. Their first chore is to drag twisted steel away from the wellhead so they can get access to it. Asa Boyabas heads the Kuwaiti firefighting team. Trained as a petroleum engineer, he was general superintendent of drilling for the Kuwait oil company before the war. But now he is driven by a different mission. We have the will and the, the, the readiness to uh, serve our country and to save our reserves, the, the wealth of our uh, kids and our uh, future generation. So uh, we are trying our best to accomplish uh, anything we can do as fast as we can. Boyabas assesses the morning's progress fighting the fire. About noon, he gauges the ground fires are contained and the heat is under control. He directs all water streams to be concentrated on the fire simultaneously, depriving the flames of oxygen. watching us and uh, it was like a trial test for us and we, I think we have succeeded. Ten four. the only other low boy should be going to BG-108 and BG-109 if they're standard low boys, over. During the third week of September, Bob Cudd's firefighting team brawls with two adjacent wells, BG-108 and BG-109. For days, their hoses spray millions of gallons of water on them, trying to cool the coke piles and douse ground fires. The wind keeps moving around, going back and forth on us. And we build a location to the left with the northwest wind, and the wind started around to the east, southeast, and, uh, and then it goes around to the northeast, and it comes around and longs to doing that, there's not much we can do about it. Twice, fickle winds have sent them scurrying for cover. Crews always work upwind of the fire not just because of heat, but once a fire is controlled, escaping hydrogen sulfide gas could suffocate. BG-108 is particularly nasty. Exploding coke in the coke pile sends red-hot missiles toward the firefighters that could burn holes in their skin instantly. 
At one point, fire crews kill the fire on BG-108, but a sudden wind shift reignites it. Unfortunately, they saw the fire coming back up the pit from the pit uh, up the trough. Just a piece of coke that was barely alight. The wind picked up, fanned it up, blew the coke up. Just went in the emulsion that's blowing out the top of the well, and off it went. Today, winds are constant. Lucky Collinsworth, the explosives man, is going to try again. He packs 23 pounds of dynamite and 12 pounds of white C4 explosive into a 55-gallon drum. Along with explosives is a dry chemical called Purple K and buckets of desert sand. Well, you can create a vacuum there. There's no oxygen or nothing. I'll fill this vacuum with Purple K, which robs the, the air of oxygen and energy, and it cools the air. Purple K is the cooling effect. And that time, by gosh, the fire snuffed out. Like an overripe fruit about to fall, the explosive charge dangles from a long neck happy rack. The charge is maneuvered directly over the wellhead. Firefighters dash toward their hoses to prevent reignition. But this time, the wind stays true. The ground fire is doused, and the blast holds. BG-108 is out for good. Firefighters kill flames several ways. While Cud's crew used explosives on BG-108 and 109, a Boots and Coots team in the Magua field relies on water. As we approach their site, they get ready to kill a blaze. They move a 30-inch pipe called a snuffer tube over the flames. There it goes. The snuffer tube forces the fire out its top. Then fire monitors begin concentrating the four streams of water strategically at its base. When your ground fire's are out of control, you've got your heat controlled all underneath. Then you can start converging on the well itself and put it out. And then when all four streams start converging, on the fire at one time, they're getting ready to snuff it out. And that's when you start concentrating on getting ready to watch it go out, because when they all converge, that's it right there. Ken Austin runs the backhoe that digs away coke and debris from the wellhead. Uh, we had some real good luck on this one here, though. The wellhead come off uh, real easy. Uh, we were only going to test it to see how strongly it was secured. It broke right off. It concentrated all the fire going upwards. We were able to break the coke away pretty easily. Uh, it made it easier to control the ground fires. Uh, this one here was pretty well textbook perfect as far as, if, if there is such a thing as textbook perfect, this is one of them. All right, I got a, uh, a low boy, 90-152, is out here by uh, yeah, 109. He's looking for number 32, sir. Firefighting efforts began painfully. In March, there weren't enough pumps or trucks or heavy equipment. Everyone sensed the urgency, but logistical and organizational problems were massive. Predictions abounded. The fires would burn two, three, even five years. By mid-spring, thousands of tons of equipment arrived every day, and fire crews began killing fires and capping wells. Bechtel Construction President Terry Farley and Project Director Tom Heisman pulled together a top team of international hands. From the beginning, Heisman has remained in the field seven days a week to plan and structure the workforce. At the Kuwait airport, regular trips by the world's largest aircraft, the Soviet Antonov, disgorged thousands of tons of equipment and supplies. The project also contracted a C-5A military-type transport for urgent cargo that could not wait for ships. In the first four months, Vectel procured more equipment in Kuwait than it did in the first four years of the Jubail mega project in Saudi Arabia. 